showcase. These are all the events that have qualified for state championships, which will be next weekend in Surwater, uh, where you're going to see a variety of events tonight. And the schedule, or the, the program here, is going to be a little bit different because we've got three girls that are still at a softball game, and I had one that went home sick today. So this is uh, going to change up just a little bit. We're going to start this evening with a duet by uh, Jenny and Ellie Labus. And this is, uh, both of these two girls have each also qualified another event for state. Uh, Jenny has a poetry and Ellie has a prose also going to state. But tonight you'll see their duet. So come on. I am auditioning for the play. What part? Della! That's the part I wanted! <laughs> In this selection, we see how the audition process works. In more ways than one. Elizabeth is ready for her audition. And Emma is ready to steal her part. <laughs> Watch to see who gets the, the Role of Della by John Wooten. was taken, haven't you? Excuse me? So, what role will you be interested in? Della? <laughs> Della, really? Yes. Why not? What piece will you be doing? Today I'll be Can doing... Can you back? Oh, sorry. You do know you only have two minutes. Yes. Good morning. My name is Elizabeth Ryan, and today... Just do the monologue. children and had her husband killed. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I thought this piece was appropriate. Actors do not think that they act. Those who think, think. Those who act, act. Those who 
those who think they can act spend more time thinking than actually acting. Of course, I'm sorry, ma'am. Please do it again. No. Tell me a story. Something funny. Funny? Yes. Make me laugh. Just like that? Are you an actress or aren't you? Of course I am. The make me laugh. Okay. One time my friend Carol and I found this old dollhouse. So we cleaned it up. Well, Carol had this pet mouse named Binky, and we dressed him up in this adorable... So a secret listed Sandy in Greece as one of your credits. Oh, yes, it was such a great pleasure working with Paul Jones. Do you know him? Didn't anyone ever tell you not to lie on your resume? I didn't. Oh, come now. I swear, I didn't. There's no character listing here for the Glass Menagerie. Or was it done in the absurdist style, or did you play the gentleman caller? <laughs> I played Laura. <laughs> it must have been some time ago. It was last summer. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you with the story. Anyways, after he dressed Binky up in the Barbie doll dress, he crawled into the bathtub as if he wanted to take a bath. I just had an accent. And, and then Binky got stuck in the closet, so he had to take the dollhouse and shake it up and down. And Binky pops out and he's all happy. So he runs on downstairs, and Carol's mom's boss sees it, and who knows what happens next. It's still in Spanish. And, and then La Grande Jefe de Mando Not Grande the Spanish Pondo dialogue, the Spanish accent, comprende? I can't do a Spanish accent! Then at least she would have some energy. Act the story out. Okay. Well, after Mickey ran downstairs, Carol's mom and boss saw it, like I said before, and then she screamed! And so she clapped up onto the couch and pulled up her skirts. She wasn't wearing any underwear. Fast. And then her husband tried to catch up and then pushed her off to the double salt and said, That's her! And everyone was running around because they hate fires and there was a No words! I'm a little early. It's just that I saw the door open and was wondering if I should come in. 
I'll be back in a few minutes. Oh, of course I have my audition card. Here you go. I must say, it's such a pleasure to meet you, Miss Stewart. I've heard so many great things about you in your theater. John Wise says hello. Oh, he's doing fantastic. Oh, of course. Good morning. My name is Emma Wins, and I would like to be considered for the role of Della. Go ahead and jump to Annalena this evening. Uh, Annalena has qualified an original oration for State. Um, this is her junior year. Is that right? Okay. Annalena Simmons. June morning. I roll over, hit the snooze button, and hope for just five more minutes of sleep. When I finally wake up and head outside, I feed the cattle, help my brother out with the goats, and take care of the show livestock. I can just see the sun starting to come up over the horizon. I can hear the cows and calves mooing at each other in the pasture across the road. And I can see my family and my neighbors harvest herb in their wheat trucks full of grain heading to the elevator. I know that it's going to be a long day. Whether my brother and I spend the day washing and working with the show livestock, or if it's helping Grandma and Grandma out with the wheat harvest. Many students in rural communities wake up the same way I do. They wake up knowing their help is much needed on a family farm. However, families like these are becoming a dying breed as family farms are overtaken by larger corporate farms. Today, I will begin by looking at some of the problems facing today's family farmers. I will then move on and look at how these problems are impacting the rest of our society. And finally, I will look at what can be done to help solve some of these problems. Let's begin by looking at some of the problems facing today's family farmers. Family farming has come a long way in the past hundred years. Farming used to be all about the horse-drawn plow and the labor-intensive manual work. It is taking great strides towards becoming a more modernized and technology-driven industry. And while these advances do save time and energy, they are also the reason that many family farmers cannot survive. The average price for a new tractor in 2007 well exceeded $200,000, not to mention the thousands of dollars spent annually on equipment repairs. These costs, combined with the rising costs in livestock feed, fuel, and veterinary care, have driven many family farmers into bankruptcy. And while these costs continue to rise, the grain and livestock markets do not follow the same suit, so many family farmers cannot make enough added income to cover their rising outcomes. Many family farmers even live in a state of poverty. According to a 1993 study done by the USDA Economic Research Service, 23% of all families involved in production agriculture technically live below the national poverty line. The hog industry is another example of how Corporate farming is taking over American agriculture. A mere 50 companies produce two-thirds of our nation's entire pork supply, and the top three companies control nearly 20% of the entire hog industry. This means that the numerous family hog farmers in America only account for one-third of our nation's pork supply. With this severe amount of competition among family pork producers, the market price of finished hogs has reached an all-time low. This hits the purebred pork producer especially hard. Linus Silbert, a purebred hog producer from Iowa, says that hogs are the reason he got involved in production agriculture. But with corporate farms producing all of their own processing hogs, using the cheapest genetics possible, and by controlling a large majority of the market, family hog farmers are continually forced out of business. And as more and more of these family producers sell their livestock, there is less and less need for the quality genetics of producers like Solberg. When asked why he was considering leaving the hog industry, Solberg replied, it's no fun anymore. It's no fun to work 60 to 70 hours a week just to break even. Let's move on and look at how these problems are impacting the rest of our society. Family farming has long been a tr tradition in America, 
But with our country losing around 30,000 family farms every year, the end of family farming seems inevitable. And as more and more family farms disappear, so do the small rural communities that they belong to. Many times these small rural towns depend on family farming for almost their entire economies. Events such as harvest and livestock production sales draw crowds of people to these smaller towns. And more people means more business. For example, I live on a small family farm outside of an extremely small town where the only businesses left are the post office and the grain elevator. If all the family farms in my area were to disappear, there would no longer even be a town. This is happening all over the state. The Kansas State Historical Society estimates that there are already over 700 ghost towns in the state of Kansas, many of which have appeared in just the past 50 years due to the disappearance of family farms. Outside of the small town, many consumers prefer to use family farm-raised products, as corporate farms use harsh chemicals and gross stimulants at significantly higher rates than family farmers. So naturally, consumers feel safer in the quality of product produced by family farmers. Many consumers are also concerned about other issues, the big two being the environment and animal welfare. Family farms are much safer for the environment, as they use far fewer chemicals, produce far less waste, and protect and sustain far more land than any corporate farm. As for animal welfare, family farms do not operate under the same kind of confinement situations as do corporate farms. And due to their smaller size, family farmers are much more able to monitor the health and comfort of their livestock. Finally, let's look at what can be done to help at least slow the disappearance of the family farm. To put it simply, family farmers need our full support. With the get big or get out mentality taken by the agriculture industry, family farmers no longer feel they have a place in American agriculture. However, groups that support the rights of family farmers are beginning to form. Organizations such as the National Family Farm Coalition, Farm Aid, and other community-supported agriculture, or CSA, groups. These groups do whatever it takes to ensure that the rights of family farmers aren't everywhere protected. Rural grocery stores have begun stocking local fresh produce due to consumer appeal. Have begun stocking local fresh produce due to consumer appeal. Consumers prefer to use family farm-raised products as they feel much more confident in the quality of product and quality of growing condition found on these family operations. Local farmers markets are becoming increasingly popular also due to consumer appeal. These farmers markets allow producers, uh, allow small time producers and outlet to sell their products. However, not all producers can utilize a farmers market. A grain and livestock producer cannot utilize a farmers market in the same way a fruit and vegetable producer can. Lastly, our government needs to start taking some action more legislation is needed that protects the rights of family farmers. And with 50% of all family farmers over the age of 65 versus the near 6% under the age of 35, more incentive programs are needed that are geared specifically towards returning to family farming. In conclusion, family farming is a vital part of our culture that unfortunately is disappearing at a continually more rapid rate. While family farming continues to affect our society in numerous ways, family farmers struggle financially, and corporate farms are becoming increasingly more powerful. I love waking up on that June morning to see my family and my neighbors harvesting their wheat crops. I love waking up on that June morning to the sound of the cows and the calves in the pasture across the road. But if nothing is done to protect and maintain family farming in our society, my children, and my grandchildren may never get to experience the same type of lifestyle that I sometimes still take for granted. Our next performer is Keith Allen. Uh, this will be Keith's first uh, trip to state, and he is going to perform a poetry selection for you this evening. At night, sometimes, after Miss Edna goes to bed, I go up on the roof. 
And sometimes I just sit counting the stars. And maybe one of it was my mom and another was my daddy. And maybe that's why sometimes they flicker a bit. I mean, the stars flicker. Lily's new mama didn't want no boys. Not a lot of people want boys. Not foster boys and eight babies. Ronnie Cullen's life is about to change again. Because his teacher has taught him to put his jumbled thoughts on paper, we are about to see his perspective of the world and his determination to put his family together again in Locomotion by Jacqueline Woodson. Some days, like today and yesterday, probably tomorrow, all my missings get jumbled up inside of me. Hey, you know honey with talc powder? Mom used to smell like that. And sometimes when the missing gets real bad, I go to the drugstore and before the guard starts following me around like I'm going to steal something, I go to the cosmetics lady and ask her if she has it. And when she says yeah, I say, can I smell it to see if it's the right one? Now, even though the cosmetics ladies roll their eyes at me, they let me smell it. And for those few seconds, Mom was alive again. And I'm remembering all kinds of good things about her. Like the way she sometimes just grabbed me and hugged me before I had a chance to get away. And the way her voice always sounded so good and bad at the same time when she was singing in the shower. Oh, and a red pocketbook that always had some tangerine lighters in it for me and Lily. No, I say to the cosmetics lady, it's not the right one. And then I leave real fast before somebody asks me to check my pockets, which are always empty because I don't steal. And sometimes I comb Lily's hair, and braids mostly, but sometimes a ponytail. And Lily would cry sometimes. You know, the kind of crying where no tears came out. She's such a big faker. Some days, like today, and yesterday, and probably tomorrow. That's all that's on my mind. Mama and Lily. Hair, and her sickle top time. When people ask how, I say a fire took them, and they look at me like I'm the most pitiful thing in the world. So sometimes, I just shrug and say, they just died, that's all. A fire took their bodies, that's all. And I can hear my daddy sometimes calling my name. Lonnie, sometimes. And sometimes, locomotion, come over here a minute, I want to show you something. And then I see his big hands holding something out to me. Now, Mama, she was a receptionist. When he called the office where she worked, she answered the phone like this. Grabbing paper products, how may I help you? It was her work voice. When he said something like, Ma, it's me. Her voice went back to normal, to my mama's voice. Hey, sugar, you behaving? Is the door locked? That stupid fire couldn't take all of them. Nothing could do that. No. They tell me and Lily, we can sit in a room and talk. And catch up, the tall lady says. When I ask for how long, the tall lady says an hour. And then Lily's new mom says, an hour? That's plenty of time. Sometimes I go to Lily's new mama's house to visit. I take the number 52 bus and I transfer to the number 69. And then I get off and walk five blocks. But sometimes Lily's new mama don't want me to come there. And she don't want to bring Lily to Miss Edna's house. So we meet up at the agency like today. And I look at Lily for a long time. For a long time, she looks right back at me. She's got a pink dress with flowers on it. She's got pink ribbons in her hair. Real pretty. My sister is real pretty. She's got dimples on her cheeks, and her eyes are big and round, even when she's not surprised. And they're light brown, too. Like Mom's. Mom. Some days, I don't think about Some days, I do. <laughs> Daddy, too. Not the fire alarm. I shake my head when those thoughts come. Shake them out real fast. Lily's new mama didn't want no boys. Just a sweet little girl. No one told me. I just knew. Not a lot of people want boys. Not foster boys and ain't babies. Miss Edna took me because she already raised two sons. Said she knew more about boys than she did about girls. Said she knew what to do if I didn't act right. And the first day of her arrest, tall lady. He haven't been arrested? The tall lady said. Uh-uh, not Lonnie. He's quiet. He's good. But it's hard to be quiet all the time, though. 
And sometimes Miss Edna gets to yelling at me, and that yelling isn't quiet either. You found God, Lonnie? Lily says. She's got on little white gloves, and one of her hands is holding the Bible. I wasn't looking for him, I say back. And then I smile so she knows I'm just goofing. But she doesn't smile back. Instead, she looks real serious. God is everywhere. He comes in your heart if you let him. She sounds rude enough like she's 25 instead of 8. But then her eyes get all watered. You find God, Lonnie. And maybe me and you can be together again. My eyes just get all watered, too. And I wipe them real fast. I turn to the one little window in our room so Lily won't see more tears starting to come down. Yeah, Lily. I'm gonna go looking for him, okay? And Lily gives me her Bible and kisses him on the cheek. She's got a big smile on her face. You're the best brother. Best brother in the whole world. I looked down at the Bible and let myself start grinning. That really is something else. It's Sunday, and you and your little sister are walking in the park. The sun is too bright to look up at, but you feel it on your head, neck, and down your arms. Right now, your little sister's saying, I told you, and holding tight to your hand. Right now, your little sister's just skipping along beside you with her yellow dress. I told you, Lonnie. The sunny day is already making itself into a poem about your beautiful sister Lily, skipping beside you with her yellow dress, smiling because you finally finished reading the Bible she gave you. The Bible she thinks is the only reason you two are not together. And you let her go on thinking that because she's just a little kid, and if her big brother could do anything to keep her smiling. I told you. I told you, she keeps saying. And I was right, wasn't I? All right, our next performer is Andy Creighton. Andy will perform a pro selection for you this evening. To leave Texas, Minerva? I just did. You do what you have to do. How did I ever leave Texas? I'll tell you why. My heart was broke. And I thought a change of scene might heal. Might turn the luck around. They say a person should never make hard and fast decisions when they're in a grief state. Painful memories can cause one to make changes in their life. In the following selection, Minerva Prey remembers her past and all the events that made her leave home in American Pie by Michael Lee West. After Freddie went to medical school, she explained it to me. It's thought or flight. It's the body's reaction to stress. That made sense to me. Long ago, all the thought had gone out of me. It's nobody's wonder that I was left with the flying. It took a long time to weigh me down. Though I had started out as a feisty woman, me and Hattie married the Prey Brothers in a double ceremony. My first child came in 1934, the 10th of January. And the doctor told me, your baby's stuck in birth now. I sat up in bed and looked him square in the eye. Say again? <laughs> it seemed to me the doctor was all wrong. My body wasn't no canal. No, my baby was like them tiny ships in a bottle. The Lord only knows how it got there. But it was trapped for all time, unless he broke the glass. Amos Jr. was born, and I said to myself, one child is surely enough. <laughs> then, late in the summer of 1937, I skipped my woman's time. Amos told me that we'd fill the house up to the rafters. <coughs> my baby girl was born on real easy. Came to Josephine. It turned out she was stoned out. Small. I know my Josie was small, but how can you behave when you can't hear your mama's voice? You don't see danger until it slaps you upside the head. In between chasing after Josie and Amos Jr., I got worn down. Three years later, I worn out to my soul. Had me another baby girl in 1941, named her Ruthie, after my mom's mama. And we were all relieved when she could hear a pin drop 50 yards away. During them, how our depression is, Bird and Hattie moved to the ranch. They wasn't blessed with children, but they still had high hopes. Then the spring arrived, bringing with it a stream of warmish and dirty air. 
and my babies came down with high fevers. The doctor called it Scalenta, said that it was making the rounds, said there was nothing we can do but wait it out. On the eleventh day, Josie was almost well, and the baby's fever had broke, but Amos Jr. was still hot and flushed, two weeks come out of his bed. He asked me for a spoonful of ice, and of course there was none to be had. I would have sold my soul to get my baby some ice. So Earl hitched up the wagon and rode into town to the ice house. While he was gone, little Amos started jerking all over, his teeth locked, and his eyes rolled back inside his head. Then he was still. When Burl shut up with the ice, it was too late. Well, I had prepared Emma Stringer's body for the funeral. I laid me down in my bed and cried. I will not get over this. I cannot get paid for heartbreak. People stopped by and told me that if I needed anything, just to let them know. I wanted to shake them and cry while well, I need the labors. You give my boy back to me. But it wasn't their fault. The real shame was mine. Now, despite my grief, a little bit of the world had opened up, showing me some hard secrets. After a longish time, I got up off my bed, pinned up my hair, and went out to greet the mourners. The screen door had been opened and closed a thousand times. When nobody was looking, Josie wandered out of the house. By the time we spotted her, she was standing in Mr. Van Hoyser's pasture, where the bull had broke loose from the fencing. As Josie knelt thick blue bonnets, Amos clapped his hands. Josie! He hollered. She never looked up. He clapped again in a cubby of Bob Watts' head out of the bush. Amos and the bull took off running for Josie at the same time. I screamed out her name. Josie! Josie! But it wasn't no use. She was knocked up into the sky. All thrown out. Her wide knock down blowing. When Amos started out to gather her up, the bull tried to run him down too. I tried to help, but the woman grabbed my arms. Bro reached out to grab me, but I sank down to one knee. The Lord was not supposed to send more trouble than you can stand, but he must not have been paying attention. Amos dove under the fence and scooped up Josie. I broke loose from the woman and ran. Blood was streaming from Josie's nose and ears. I wiped it away with him in my dress, but it came right back. Amos lowered his head to her chest. Her heart still beat. He said, we got her to the house and laid her on the bed. The neighbors flooded around us, bringing washcloths and pans of water. Someone wrote to town for the doctor. Open your eyes, Josie, I said. Amos put his hands on my shoulder. Before the doctor got there, she stopped breathing. But her heart kept on beating. I could hear it fluttering around the room like a trapped bird. There was nothing left to do but open the door and set it free. I lost my faith. The Lord seemed vengeful, taking away my babies. And I was through worshiping him. what happened. She was fixing those dumb paper decorations, you know, for the church bazaar, when she was up on a ladder. I was standing right under her. And then she started whispering to me. Hold me, Willie. Hold me, I'm scared. <laughs> so, I stuck my hand out to set here. Only I accidentally put it on her leg. Well, gosh, she didn't move her leg or wear nothing. She just said, hold me, Willie. Hold me tighter. <laughs> Move my hand up a little bit. I mean, what's a feller supposed to do? I thought the ladder was going to fall. Well, despite my efforts, the ladder, it, it, it fell. We were on this big old tangled up heap, and she was on top of me, and the ladder was on top of both of us, and we were so tangled up, I, I 
couldn't even move. <laughs> the 1890s was not a particularly easy time for a young man to learn about the birds and the bees, as poor Willie will soon find out. But don't you worry, because his mother, his father, and his grandfather <laughs> will soon set him straight in Promenade All by David Robinson. Well, they all came running out and they pulled us apart. You've never heard more yellings and carrying on in your entire life. Well, her mother, she started to bawl and the minister said that ah, I should be horsewhipped. And <laughs> then. Willie, we need to have a talk. Yes, ma'am. Stop fidgeting, would you? Mom, I wasn't. You were going to. How could you do such a thing, Willie? How could you? You brought disgrace on this house. Disgrace it is never known. And that girl, you disgraced her too. She'll probably have to leave the town. Why? Because of you. She'll never be able to lift her face again. No, Mom, not her. You don't even know her. I do too. I've known her since she was a little girl. She's a fine girl from a decent family. Gosh, Mom. You watch your language, young man. <laughs> Mom, it was an accident. It was no accident. You were looking right at that girl's skirts. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't. The skirts were like right here. They blew my eye level. That's physically impossible. <laughs> Obviously, they weren't short enough for you to get your hand right under them. <laughs> ah! <laughs> was she? Was she? There ain't any drawers, and I want the truth, Willie! No! But it was a really, really hot day! Now, son, 
button should be the first thing that comes to your mind every time. It's a family business, you know, and one day it will be yours. All right, life. All right, son, there are two things you must promise me. Number one, uh, you know what, J just stay away from loose women. And number two, uh, when, you, when you can't keep your mind on your business, you'll take, take long walks or a cold bath. And you'll lift weights to get strong. <laughs> yeah. I, that pretty much covers it, son. Ah! Grandfather Hunsinger! Grandfather Hunsinger, come talk to the boy! The boy's gotta learn about life! Ah. <laughs> He'll learn about life from other boys. That's the way to do it. That's the American way. <laughs> He's already getting in trouble with women! I heard all about it. <laughs> Little troubled girls never hurt nobody. <laughs> I got in a lot of trouble with girls when I was his age. <laughs> and then stuff my girl, Penny. That is sinful! <laughs> ah, you're a worrier. And that's bad for the digestion. I'm a mother. And a mother gets concerned when her son wants to go off to college. <laughs> oh, college? Well, why didn't you say so? I'll go have a little talk with the boy. <laughs> Will it? Come here, son. So, uh, I hear you've been uh, canoodling, <laughs> a girl. Grandpa, I wasn't canoodling any girl. Hey, now, you know who you're talking to. This ain't your mom, and this ain't your dad. This is your grandfather, Hudson. You got my blood in your veins, boy. That's a good thing. <laughs> and I hear you've been uh, canoodling a girl. So you got her up a ladder, did you? That's a good one! Not it's an old one. But it's a good one! <laughs> Did, uh, you help any girls up a ladder when you were my age, Grandpa? Did I help any boy? I was born and raised in the country. I helped many a girl up a ladder. <laughs> ah, yeah, country style. I help them up. <laughs> you get the big picture on it. So, uh, what were you doing with your other hand, boy? I'm studying the ladder so it wouldn't fall. Boy, the good Lord did not give you no hand to study no ladder. You gotta learn. Do you have any idea what you were doing? I don't know, it just kind of popped in my head. Boy, your head ain't got nothing to do with it. That's my blood and you running hot. Ha! That's a good thing. You liked it though, didn't you? <laughs> You want to do it again. Out! What was that for? For getting caught. Now, if there's one thing I've learned in all my years, is to never get caught. You understand? Write that in your book in big, bold letters. Never get caught, all right? Boy, you look confused. All right, here we go. Wrong. It's, uh, it's something that you've done, and uh, somebody calls it that. They don't know you've done it. They can't call it wrong, you understand? All right. Now, stand up, boy, let me hear you say it. Never get caught. Never get caught. Boy, say it louder. Never get caught. Boy, say it like you mean it. Never get caught! Thank you. <laughs> My love, <laughs> my wife, come back. 
conduct a cup and savory guide. <laughs> oh, true apothecary. Night drugs are quick. Heaven so dark as a tomb? Oh wait, I'm not I'm not dead but live? Oh damned apothecary, the house want me a sleeping potion and not poison. Thou hast punk me. But <laughs> where is my wife? She should lay beside me in death and rest. She lies upon the stony floor as if she had been neuter and had moved herself. Could it be that she still lives? But lo, a dagger lies within her tender heart. Oh poor self-killing beauty. That must have woken on the side of my supposed corpse, killed herself. The very thought of it makes me faint. Last I swooped me. I saved my sweet Julia's life from only to take it away again. A book of jokes? <laughs> oh, cruel jests, I find a merit with me in this hour of woe. Although this one does look funny. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, with my heart. <laughs> whoa, whoa, get off me, freak! <laughs> <laughs> oh, which is my husband, Romeo. <laughs> <laughs> oh, friend of ours, friend. You're still in a state of ragamortis. Off me! Oh. <laughs> oh! My word, this suicide business is rather exhausting. <laughs> I'm a London dagger. Let us try this again. Not second thought. Maybe there's a more comfortable way to die. No. <gasps> Maybe this pillow can gently smother me to death until I wake again in paradise. <laughs> Come, pillowy death. Come, eternal sleep. 
Thank goodness, there's only a minor heart attack. Romeo! Ah, Pillow Demon! Pillow Demon, what? Oh, Romeo, you gotta hit him. Please help me with this blinding garment. Stand down, demon, I'm no longer feared. <laughs> Alas, I am too late. Oh, poor Juliet, beaten down to the bone. <laughs> oh, Juliet, I will love you forever. Even your grotesque skeleton is delightful to me. <laughs> Forget my delay in joining you in eternal sleep. I suppose I should kill myself in some deadly manner and join you in paradise. <laughs> or I could, as my old girlfriend Rosaline. <laughs> she was cool, too. such a dreary place for a clue to this murky mystery. So dark it is. Take my hand. Thy hand is warm and comforting. <laughs> thy palm is soft and smooth. Your wrist is strong. Your skin is tender. Oh, manly is thy elbow. <laughs> Fragrant is the fit of thy arm. Your broad shoulder. The nape of your neck. Your clear chin. Your promiscuously kissable lips. Your attempt at a mustache. Your uneven nostrils. Your eyes. <laughs> your eyes. Perfectly beautiful. Beautifully perfect. Oh, but what if we're siblings? He gets it! <laughs> Could be true. Ugh. Let us search the sense of somber abode to a clue to this murky mystery. Could we hold hands once we search? <laughs> Certainly. This one lies empty. There's an inscription that reads, Juliet Capulet. Does that ring the bell? You know, it, it does. As if it has echoed through my ears a thousand times. What about you? Juliet really does not suit me. Although, you do look like a Juliet. Read on, there's further inscription. Does the name Montague sound familiar? Well, it says my sure name, although I do not remember the first. Does the name Romeo ring familiar? Why well, it says my name, Romeo Montague. Oh, then behold this inscription, Montague. Juliet Capulet died heartbroken, grief stricken by the motive of her new no but slain by the dreaded villain, Romeo Montague. Montague, huh? Yes, Montague. Thou art my mortal enemy. <laughs> Never, although you can't feel that to seem a little hot headed and brash. So no wonder we monsters tried to turn out your ranks. <laughs> thou wretched boy that did send my cousin to the shores of Hades, thou shalt join him hence! This shall determine that. <laughs> Ugh! 
<laughs> Aside the punctured organs, they're not so bad. How do you fare? I wish I would have kept York's classic book of day's jokes in my dress! Ooh. Here we die. Two sword cross lovers. I'm gonna just die with the kiss. <laughs> It's way, way too long. long. So, we'll cut off the first time she kills herself? Great. One more thing. Could you get a happy ending? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My next performance uh, performer will be uh, Miss Jenny Stratton, who is my four-year senior. I always thought <laughs> I was going to do her last, but uh, hopefully those other girls will come here just a little bit. <coughs> Uh, it's always hard to say goodbye to my four-year seniors, and uh, this one I'm just going to more than anybody. Yeah. Yes. All right, Jenny is going to perform a pro selection for you tonight, um, and this will be her last for the last week. <laughs> The nights are hard, but the days, they're even harder. One of my duties on the day shift is to dismiss the soldiers who are ready to be sent back home to hospitals in the U.S. The other day, it was a 21-year-old whose nose and half his face had been blown away and replaced with patchwork grass. The morning of his release, I found him crying on his bed. What's wrong? I'm going to die. God, if I can't die, at least don't send me home. Not looking like this. I wanted to tell him that everything would be okay. That plastic surgery could work wonders. But I didn't know that for sure. I was raised to believe that freedom, democracy, our way of life was worth protecting at any cost. Well, that price I've been learning can be very high. Winnie Smith comes from a long line of warriors, so it was no surprise when she signed up as an army nurse. She was filled with pride for her family and her country. But after being sent to Vietnam, she learns the cold, brutal reality of war and the adjustments that must be made after. An American Daughter Gone to War by Winnie Smith. Saigon, 1966. I have learned so much since I've been here. One of the hardest things I've learned, ironically, is how to let go. I am a nurse. It is my instinct to help people. But sometimes the best thing for me to do is to just step back. If you have never seen the terror of a man with one leg taking his first steps on crutches, or the frustration of a man with one arm trying to butter a piece of bread, all I can do to keep myself from doing everything for them. But I can't. Because they're going to have to learn sometime. Their wounds will not heal. Saigon, 1967. Every once in a while, the U.S. will send in celebrities to help cheer up the troops. Today, Ms. Nancy Sinatra is here. She is wearing high-heeled boots, a tight little mini skirt, and heavy makeup as she claps down the ICU, bending at each bedside to kiss each cheek. But eventually, I guess the bloody stumps and many comas were just too much for her. And she ran out, crying, with her bodyguards following close behind. Now I'm really mad. If she couldn't have handled it, then she shouldn't have come. She drops in here. Dressed to the hilt, chauffeured around in a sedan. And tomorrow, she'll get on a private jet and head back to the U.S., where everyone will congratulate her on what a great thing she did. I would like her to stay here for a year or two. I would like her to climb up six flights of stairs every day wash her hair in a trickle of water every night. 
I would like Miss Nancy Sinatra to wear those boots while walking through mud puddles. To wear that heavy makeup while sweating it on a ward. And to parade around in that miniskirt without a bodyguard to defend her. I want her to see the soldiers who come in dying from the field with bloody pussy wounds. And I would like her to see a young man so hard to say, die right before her eyes. I think then, if she still could, she might have cause to cry. Saigon, 1968. We had a huge rush at the hospital today. They brought in hundreds from a nearby village. Vietnamese, American, it was more than our staff could handle. One of them was this little Vietnamese girl. She couldn't have been more than nine years old. She was completely naked, covered in blood with shrapnel sticking right through her skin. As I ran to get a damp towel to cover her, a doctor grabbed my arm. What are you bothering with her for? She's a patient. Let her die. You bust your ass to save her life, and you'll end up paying with it with none of our soldiers. Listen to me. You spend your time babysitting, and this place will fall apart. I knew he was right. I am an army nurse. My responsibility is to the soldiers. I, I am not sure how much more this I can take. I just want to go home. North Carolina, 1973. It's been three years since I came back home, and I still don't feel like I belong here. I spend my days walking through the woods, and my nights drunk, alone, at my kitchen table. Controversy rages in America over the war. It's the warmongers against the peaceniks, and who's caught in the middle? The returning warriors. There are just so many things that are hard to adjust to. I work at the hospital, and the other day, they brought in this 19-year-old traumatic amputee victim from a motorcycle accident. The whole staff showered him with pity, and I could not feel sorry for him. It was only one leg, and it was below the knee at that. That is nothing! That is nothing compared to what boys younger than him are losing every day in Vietnam. But I didn't say that. No one even knew that but me. I try to live the, leave the past behind me. I try to live one day at a time, but I don't even know what that means. I don't know. I don't know if I am ever going to be okay again. We're going to go ahead and, and do our next performance. Uh, she has been in after the softball game and she is going in pretty cold here, so she said to tell you that. Uh, this is Kendall Perry, and she will be performing a serious solo for you this evening. She is also qualified in pro selection, uh, but she will perform her solo. Calm her all morning. I walked up and down the length of my long porch, jiggling her in my arms, watching Charlie Cloudy go. 
Charlie wasn't a farmer. He was the teller at the Citizens Bank, and he was proud to bring home his $14 every week. Before the Depression, he'd had hopes of advancing the cashier. Me? I'd been hankering to start me a garden early. I thought it would ease my mind from worrying about my screaming baby, from worrying about all the awful things going on. You see, there's so much good in the garden, if you don't count what happened to Adam and Eve. In life, you do what you have to do in order to survive. And in 1932, times were hard. Miss Gussie and her husband Charles are faced with a decision that will haunt them forever from Crazy Ladies by Michael Lee West. We lived on the edge of town, but we had no close neighbors. My nerves were laid wide open from Dorothy's high-pitched cries, which I could not soothe and could not help but take personal. There was also the year a series of murder shot Crystal Falls. <coughs> the victims, four young women, had been stabbed to death. But I'd also heard that the newspapers hadn't reported everything. <coughs> It was late afternoon when Dorothy finally fell asleep. So I sat her in her bassinet and I wheeled her on into the kitchen. <coughs> and I looked out my big picture window and see Charlie pulling the plow into the barn. And I glanced out at our garden. It was long and narrow, almost in the center of our backyard. I heard Charlie lumbering in onto the back porch and he came on in, gave me a kiss on the cheek and he went on upstairs to bathe. And I sat down at my big kitchen table and began getting my seed packets ready for the next day. Watermelon, <coughs> cucumbers, cantaloupe. A cool breeze rushed into the room. And I remember that I left the screen door open and I thought I ought to close it before Dorothy got a chill. And that's when I saw the man. He was outlined in the screen mesh. Oh, Jesus, how long had he been watching me? What do you want? He said nothing. He stepped into my kitchen, and the wicked stench filled the room. Cold whiskey. He was barely out of his teens. I didn't ask you to come into my house, now did I? Again, he said nothing. He stepped deeper into my kitchen, and he grabbed my best butcher knife out of my dish drainer, and he pointed it at me. You take your clothes off, and you get on the floor. He looked too young to be telling me what to do. I most certainly will not. He took a few steps toward me, and he grabbed my arm and pointed the knife against my throat. And I waited for him to plunge the knife deep into my windpipe. <laughs> Upstairs, I heard the water continue to gush into the tub. And I knew that Charlie couldn't hear me. But the murderer didn't know that. <laughs> you get out of my house! My husband's right upstairs. He will come down here, and he will blow your head off. The boy did nothing. He glanced up at the ceiling and back at me, and I saw that he would kill Charlie, too. At that moment, Dorothy's cry snapped off and he walked over to my baby. He put the butcher knife in her best and then he flipped her pink blanket back and I could not breathe. So I stepped back and I reached for Charlie's shotgun and I took aim. But I was scared that the buckshot would hit Dorothy. You get out of my house, I will blow your head off myself. The boy just looked at me, so I took aim again. Lordy Jesus! me hit him in the heart and I pulled the trigger. The boy sunk to the floor, a hole in his chest, blood pouring everywhere. Mercy heavens, Gussie, what happened? <coughs> tell me now, Gussie, tell me what happened. I lowered the gun and I looked around in my kitchen. Blood splattered across my pine cabinet. Across Dorothy's vest, and then Dorothy, I ran to her and I gathered her up in my arms. Gussie, tell me now what happened. You have to tell me now, Gussie. He was going to rape me, Charlie. And he was going to kill Dorothy. The truth was, I had no idea if he would have killed her. But I knew that he would have killed me. Gussie, do you even know who this boy is? Tell me you remember this boy, Gussie. Just wait. Just wait a minute.
Claude Edmund Wentworth, the youngest boy. Claude Edmund Wentworth was the president of the bank where Charlie worked. Just tell me what to do, I'll tell the truth! They'll believe me when they hear Charlie, they'll believe me, I'll tell them everything that happened, I promise I'll tell the truth! What if they already know the truth? The Wentworth's blood is thickest of all, and they will drag our names through the mud before they do their own. They could foreclose on our house, Gussie. Just wait. Let's, let's bury him now, Charlie. No, Gussie, we won't do this. He's not even dead. He's just fainted from the pain. We won't do it. Yes, we will, Charlie. We'll do it. And we'll never talk about it ever again, Charlie. We'll do it. Gussie, we'll burn in hell. Charlie walked out of the kitchen, leaving me with that bleeding man and my screaming baby. <laughs> Later that night, I finally got Charlie to wrap the boy's body in one of my old sheets. About the brightest moon I'd ever seen, he carried the boy's body to the edge of the garden. And we dug for what seemed like forever, but we dug, running softly when our shovel struck rock. From the house, I heard Dorothy's cry start up again, but I didn't care. <coughs> it was me who wanted to hell with the moon, so I began digging harder, getting in rhythm. When Charlie finally pushed the boy's body into the hole, I heard his final muffled moan. Mother! <gasps> but, oh, I felt no pity. I remembered the knife in my throat and the picture of the women in the newspaper. So I dropped to my knees and I began pushing the dirt in with my hands. I pictured the boy, his mouth full of dirt, crawling his way toward the moon. Gussie, stop it! For the love of God, stop it! I thought we talked about this. I thought we said we would never talk about this ever again, Charlie. Do you remember? Never will we talk about this ever again. Charlie wiped his face off on his sleeve. He went back to filling up the grave. That next summer, my garden produced enormous cucumbers and cabbages. My corn was so sweet and soft that you could cut it off the cob with a spoon. <laughs> and my tomatoes, well, they were full of red juice. Thank you very much. This is Parker Roth, and she will be performing uh, an informative speech for you. since five o'clock this morning definitely tells me something. It means I'm trying to hide my nerves. But when I see you smile, well, that tells me you want to be here. No, wait. That's got to be a cover-up. I'm sure you're just being polite. Since you're so polite, you must have a ton of friends. Since you have a ton of friends, I bet you have a dinner date with one of them after this, which means probably want me to hurry up with my speech. <laughs> Which means you're definitely smiling to be polite. The art of reading people has puzzled even scientists, but it may be as simple as observing others around you, and the advantages to reading people are endless. Today I will begin by laying the foundation of becoming a good people reader. I will then expose how to detect a liar in a non confrontal way, and finally I will tell you how to react to certain types of people once we've read them. Let's begin by laying the foundation. LifeTrainingOnline.com presents the best. The first step in learning to read people is to gain a general understanding of the makeup of others, and surprisingly, ourselves. <coughs> first of all, there are four different attitudes that we portray to others. The first is polite and fairly conservative. This is what we show to people when we first meet, and when we want to make a good impression. The second, we tend to use amongst our acquaintances and our coworkers. We're still polite, but perhaps more friendly. 
Although the intentions of these conversations is to simply pass time, we feel more comfortable sharing our opinions and our feelings. The third attitude is reserved for our close friends and significant others. This attitude isn't shown as often, because this is when we are most like ourselves. Conversations using this attitude have a purpose. We don't want to just pass time, but we truly care about the other person's thoughts, and we often seek and value their advice. The fourth attitude isn't necessarily an attitude, but more of an understanding. This is the part of us that we know exists, but even we don't want to admit it. Our deepest, darkest fears and our imperfections. These four attitudes are important to note, because observing an acquaintance of yours with a close friend of theirs can tell you a lot more of their real opinions and could be a deciding factor in the continuance of your relationship. Although these four attitudes are important to note, there are a few tips you need to know. Given by former interrogator of the CIA and professional people reader Joellen Demetrius in her book, Reading People. The first is to recognize that people will reveal their attitudes according to how you reveal yours. So it's always more helpful to be the more outgoing one in a conversation. Another is to refrain from making common judgments. These assumptions can lead to very wrong conclusions. Last, but definitely not least, remember to stay open to anything. Let's move on to the fun part. Just how can you tell when someone's lying to you? <coughs> Bill Whiteside, author of the book Reading People in Sales, tells us that the most accurate way to tell if someone's lying to you is to look directly into their eyes. Everyone knows it's next to impossible to lie when looking directly into someone's eyes. But actually, there's a lot more to it than that. Hypnosiscontrol.com conducted a study and found that when eyes are pointed in different directions, it means different things. For instance, direct eye contact usually means intimidation. Eyes looking up usually means boredom, sarcasm, or annoyance. Interestingly enough, when eyes are pointed either left or right, it activates the opposite side of the brain. The right side of the brain is creative. So, if the potential liar looks left, activating the right hemisphere, he's most likely trying to come up with a story to tell you, rather than the actual truth. In contrast, if the potential liar looks right, he activates the left hemisphere. Even if the story he tells you takes a little bit of time to tell, he's probably just trying to remember what really happened. George Miller, author of the book The Magic Number no. 7, tells us that surprisingly, detecting lies has a lot more to do with reading physical clues rather than the tone of one's voice or how much one stutters. However, verbal clues are just as essential. The single most important thing to remember is to not look for the lies, but rather the truth. So, should you find yourself in a situation where you're suspicious of someone, start questioning, but start with no brainers. Where are you from? How long have you been in the business? Are there any good tourist attractions around? The answers you receive will obviously be truthful, since there's nothing to lie about. During the question, you can observe how the potential liar speaks, gestures, and generally portrays himself. After this discreet interrogation, start the real questioning, what you think they may be lying about. After this, it's fairly self-explanatory. If the patterns repeat with close to no deviation, he's probably telling the truth. If he acts noticeably different, however, there's a legitimate reason to believe he's lying. Finally, let's move on to how to react to certain types of people once we've read them. This is the tricky part. We don't want to manipulate others, but knowing how to react to certain types of people can be helpful. Michelle Matt, author of the book The Choice is Yours, tells us there are three typical types of people. Those with neutral, negative, and positive attitudes. Someone with a neutral attitude is going to see the ups and downs of each situation, and will probably be open to different opinions. Striking up a conversation with a negative person will probably be a little more difficult, since they're going to see the negative side of almost anything you bring up. The best way to handle these people is to find something you both don't like, so you can find common ground, or at least have someone to vent to on a bad day. Talking with a positive person will probably be the most fun, since they're the hardest to put in a bad mood. You do, however, have to be careful to not pick too serious of a subject. Sometimes, taking the fun out of a situation can not only drain them of energy, but can actually put them in a bad mood. A few tips in general to remember when reading people is to look for signs in the way people speak, gesture, even who they mingle with. This makes it easier for you to more efficiently communicate with them. In conclusion, today I have laid the foundation of becoming a good people reader. I've exposed how to detect a liar, and I've told you how to react to certain types of people once we've read them. 
The art of reading people has become essential in our society today. Jobs, interviews, even some relationships are no longer based solely on talent and merit alone, but on one's ability to read and in often cases manipulate others. However, reading people can still be an honest trait if we learn to do it right. Now that you're more familiar with reading people, hopefully you can tell that I'm smiling because I've enjoyed sharing this valuable information with you. And I truly hope you have a wonderful day. Miss Martha June was a person I thought incapable of telling a horse lie. I was wrong, always prim and proper. She was a church-going woman who spoke in quiet, refined tones. She owned a bakery that was known for having the best coconut cream pies in the world. Same recipe her mother used and her mother before her. But no customer was more faithful than a white character named Pete Bruce about whom she loved to tell stories. He was considered the Prince of Confidence, and the idea of Miss Martha June having anything to do with the likes of him was about as odd as a fox and a hen striking up a friendship. He is the rest of the story as she told it long ago on our front porch on a late summer night. The book Porch Lies by Patricia C. McKissack is a collection of short stories that were told long ago on Grandma's front porch. These stories were good, and they got better each time they were told. The following story is the account of when Pete Bruce came to town. I was near about 10 years old when I first said I was on Pete Bruce. He was a full-fledged rascal, and I knew it. If you went by looks alone, though, mm -mm -mm. Pete Bruce was pleasing enough. He had nice hair and wore slicked back. He had plum black skin and even darker eyes. And a devil make his sweat. It's our red legs. He always loved loud suits and clashy cars. Stood out. Pete Bruce liked that. Standing out being noticed and all. Mama sold coconut cream pies to passengers at the bus station back then. And her reputation as a super baker was known far and wide. Most people called her the pie lady. I helped mama when I wasn't in school, so folks started calling me Little Pie. It was an ordinary Tuesday morning when Pete Bruce stepped off the bus. We watched him as he dabbed his breath with the perfectly folded white linen handkerchief. Then, he studied his surroundings as if testing the wind, getting the lay of the land. Find mom and me, he picked up his cover bag and started on over. Morning, ladies. Name's Pete Bruce. Then coconut cream pies. He asked mama, examining the display she had arranged on the hood of our 28 fold. Welcome to Masonville. This is my daughter, Martha Jew. And yes, sir, these are coconut cream pies made by none other than Miss Fretchen May Boston. Yours truly. Mom extended her hand and Pete Bruce took it. He grabbed mine and shook it to it. I noticed how soft his words. This was not a man used to hard work. <laughs> Pies do look good, he said, still holding that grin like an excellent fox. Here, have a piece. Mama always let people taste the slip of her sample pie. It was great for business, because not one person had ever taken a taste and not bought the whole one. Pete removed his hat. Mm, no, ma'am. What's the matter, honey? You got sugar? He shook his head and lowered his eyes and leaned on one foot than the other. Mm, no, ma'am, I ain't diabetic. Well, what then? Well, I mean no disrespect, Miss Friendship, but there's a lady over in Steel, Miss Opal Mary, and she makes the best coconut cream pies in the world. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I have no doubt that your pie is delicious, ma'am, but it just can't be as good as Miss Opal Mary's. <coughs> Mama's back stiffened. How can you say that without ever eating mine? Pete Bruce went back to shifting his weight. Well, I'm sure your pies are fine, ma'am, but they just can't be as good as Miss Opal Mary's. 
Mama was beside herself. Well, I assure you, young man, there is no way in the world that you would be disappointed if you ate a slice of my pie. Oh, I can't be sure. Quickly, Mama cut small waste from her simple pie. She shoved it at Pete Bruce along with a whole bottle of milk. Slowly, as if it pained him to do so, he put the whole thing <coughs> in his mouth and chewed on it with his eyes closed. Well, sir, tell me the truth. Wasn't that the best thing you ever put in your mouth? Pete Bruce opened his eyes and shook his head. I wish I could say, but, but what? Well, I have. I'm confused. It's hard to tell whose is better. Yours or Miss Opal Merritt's? Well, I expect your taste buds are mighty confused. If you can't tell the difference between my pie and the other, what's her names? Mama cut an even larger piece. She washed him by until that creamy filling and flaky crust and chew it slowly. Mama, I whispered, trying to warn her. You're not going to let him get away with. Hush, child. Pete Bruce swallowed and smacked his lips. Well, I must say, Miss Frenchie, that was mighty good, but don't say it. Don't you say it. Mama held up her warning hand. She seemed almost desperate. Here, have, have one more slice. Mama shoved another huge slice at Pete Bruce, and he polished it all off in no time flat. Then, Pete gave Mama one of his special smiles. Well, ma'am, I do believe you got Miss Opal Mary beat by a country mile. Mama's face lit up like a sunbeam. <laughs> he kissed the back of her hand like a real fine gentleman in the movies, and I think Mama actually giggled. Once again, Frenchie Mayballs, who was the undisputed best coconut cream pie baker in the county. Pete Bruce popped a toothpick in his mouth, slung his copper bag over his shoulder, and started away. Turning back, he smiled at me, tipped his head, and went. In that instant, I knew that he knew he hadn't fooled me one bit. <coughs> that rascal turned out to be one of Mama's best customers. <coughs> and later on, when Mama passed and I opened my bakery, he became my best customer. And he could always make me smile, in spite of myself. <laughs>